Hello and welcome to this video on methods and sources for primary data collection. My name is Daunia Pavone and I'm going to talk to you about three main points today. First, a good start. Let's remember to start by identifying use and information needs. Quantitative and qualitative methods. And then finally, the most commonly used sources and methods and what information they can provide. A good start. On, only once we identify the information needed, we will first look at what data are already available, secondary data. The term secondary data refers to any data that has been collected, collated and analyzed by other agencies, institutions or bodies and likely was not collected for our specific purpose. We will then move to primary data collection to fill the gap or the gaps that secondary data could not cover. Primary data are data collected by the organization or by the researcher undertaking an information management activity to directly address the set objectives and research questions. At this point, we look at sources and methods and select the most appropriate ones. Each method and source will be able to provide some information and not another. No one source and method by themselves will ever be sufficient. Each method is better suited for a specific information need and respondent. Methods complement one another by providing the data that can describe the full picture. This is also true when considering qualitative and quantitative methods to obtain data. What do we mean by qualitative and quantitative? The PIM common terminology defines qualitative data as data that provide description, experience, and meaning, and that can be observed, but not measured. They're non-numerical information. This data can be collected, for example, through open-ended or semi-structured interviews, focus group discussions, observations, narrative texts, and reports. For example, the resilience mechanism of a community. On the other hand, quantitative data are defined as a type of information or data that can be measured. For example, the number of children not attending school. Qualitative methods allow to go in depth and capture nuances and meaning, allow to follow up immediately during data collection if something is unclear and use open-ended questions allowing for more options than anticipated by the researcher. They are, however, based on a small number of respondents and they're more time consuming. consuming. The findings cannot be generalized. Examples of qualitative methods often used in our work are individual interviews with protection experts or service providers and focus group discussions. Other methods are called quantitative. They allow to quantify and measure, allow to see correlations. Some allow to generalize the results to the whole group, depending on the methodology used. And it is easier to achieve a larger geographical coverage and a larger sample with quantitative methods. However, the number of answer options and nuances are usually limited and cannot modify the question immediately during data collection. Look at this example. We were asking if latrines had a functional lock as a proxy for GBV risk. It did, but there was nothing in the questionnaire about the latrine having no walls or the lock being on the outside. Some examples of quantitative methods are household level surveys, key informant interviews with closed questionnaires, as in the case of the IOM, DTM, MSLA, multi-sector location assessments. 
Is it possible to state that quantitative is better than qualitative? It seems to be what most people in this sector imply. We all want to have numbers, and we seem to believe that numbers must be true and better than other types of information. But look at the example in the vignette. Is the quantitative information the best choice to know how much my man loves me? No. Look at this other example. Now, is qualitative information the best choice to book a table at a restaurant? No. And if I do not use quantitative information, I will probably end up not eating in the restaurant. Both quantitative and qualitative methods fit different purposes and are the most effective solution in different situations. This is very important, and we should always remember and stay away from considering that the word data is a synonymous of the word numbers. For example, data on persons with disabilities is much more than just the estimated number of persons with disabilities in a community. Barriers, resources, dynamics, coping strategies, cultural understanding of disability, are often more important information to develop inclusive programs than the number of persons with disabilities. So use both qualitative and quantitative methods, each to collect the information they are fit to collect and obtain a complete picture. And you often want to mix them. We start investigating something qualitatively we get an understanding that allows us to better structure a questionnaire. We use the questionnaire to collect quantitative data and then go back and check qualitatively the findings. You will see an example of this in the video on a community engagement by CPA WeWorld. The triangulation of data there from quantitative and qualitative methods allows them to not only get better results, but create the path to link the protection risks to the root causes. Let us now look at sources and methods most often used in the humanitarian context and what they are better suited to find out. Individual interviews. These are structured interviews where one individual speaks on his or her behalf about his or her perspective. The results can be generalizable or not, depending on the sampling methodology used. Among other things, we can use individual interviews to obtain information on barriers faced, intentions, access to goods and services, demographics, displacement non migration dynamics, documentation, access to documentation, experiences, employment, resources, professional or educational backgrounds. Let's look at interviews with households. These are structured interviews as well, but where one member of the household usually speaks on behalf of the rest of the household. Also in this case, the results can be generalizable or not, depending on the sampling methodology used. We can use interviews with households to obtain information, for example, on use of services, satisfaction, awareness, and barriers to basic goods and services, intentions for return or for settlement, income, food security of the household, land and property issues, personal documentation. We can use household level interviews also to identify some information about each member of the household. And therefore we can collect demographic data, age, gender of family members, number of persons with specific needs, uh, including persons with disabilities. We should always remember that only certain sampling methods will allow to generalize the results to the whole population. Note that we will not try to collect data on domestic violence through this method or source. Remembering that the perpetrator of that violence may be present during the interview, or even be the one answering the questions. Let's move now to key informants interviews. 
These are also structured interviews where one person speaks on behalf of his or her entire community. Key informants are not usually sectoral experts. For example, they're not health workers, they're not protection experts or wash experts. We can use the key informant interviews to obtain information at community level on number of people, for example, IDPs per location, coordinates of the locations, an extremely important piece of information for any type of assistance or protection activity, the languages used in the location, the availability of goods and services, infrastructure or other identifiable aspects of the life in a community that may increase or decrease the risk for protection, child protection and GBV incidents. For example, the lighting near the toilets or on the paths, overcrowding, shel overcrowded shelters, lack of any shelter, lack, locks on the shelter or on bathing facilities, presence of security providers. We can also use key informant interviews to identify some, some barriers to accessing goods and services. For example, the distance to school or the distance to a healthcare center or to a distribution center. But we cannot use the key informant interviews to understand the specific barriers that a specific subgroup would face. For example, we cannot use it to understand the specific barriers to accessing healthcare by women. Displacement dynamics, we can get also from the key informant interviews, places of origin of displaced population, secondary displacement, or reasons why the community was displaced. And finally, we could also identify threats of evictions to the community uh, through the key informant interviews. Let's now look at another type of interview with sectoral experts and service providers. These are semi-structured interviews with experts about a topic. The expert speaks as an expert, not in personal terms. We can use interviews with experts to obtain information, for example, on main protection issues in the community, dynamics in or between groups, legal or social consequences for survivors of violence, resilience mechanisms, bottlenecks to the functioning of the services, and other aspects of the quality of goods and services. And finally, let's look at focus group discussions. Discussions um, with more than one individual with similar characteristics that are functional to the topic of discussion. These are homogeneous groups. Important to remember that the choice of who is part of the group is functional to, def to the defined purpose and the information we're trying to collect. We can use focus group discussions to obtain information on barriers faced by specific groups to accessing goods and services. For example, women, children, or persons with disabilities. We can find information about groups' own mechanisms or to reduce uh, risks or support survivors, uh, locations where the group feels safe or doesn't feel safe, quality of the security provider, and finally, what is that increases or decreases the risk for that specific group. This information can be used, of course, for programming, but also, for example, to design a more effective quantitative data collection questionnaire. Note that focus group discussions are different from discussions with community groups, where the group is likely not homogeneous. This clearly impacts the freedom of respondents to answer Power dynamics or cultural norms may be at play and limit that freedom. For example, we would not use a group discussion to explore GBV or child protection topics, but we may be able to use a focus group discussion if it's a homogeneous focus group discussion to find out such details. Let us always remember, in addition to the methods and sources I mentioned, that there are other methods and sources we can use. Observation, both structured or unstructured. Facility assessments, healthcare facility assessments, education facility assessments, and so on. Analysis of existing administrative data. Expertise of members of our own protection teams who know a lot. 
Finally, a very important note on collecting prevalence data for GBV, child protection, and some other types of violence. The strong key message here is do not try to collect such prevalence data. It may be possible to collect the number of unaccompanied children, or with careful design, you can collect the prevalence of child marriage in a region. But not how many children, women, and men have been raped, maltreated, trafficked, or involved in hard labor, and such other information. Attempts to collect such data in most of the contexts where we work will produce misleading data and is likely to do harm. The reason is that these phenomena are hidden, taboo, or crimes. The people interviewed will not be able to answer honestly or openly or with precise information because they either do not know or do not dare to respond. If we try to obtain such data from interviews, we may even put the enumerators and the respondents at risk. Even if we consider the police records or the case of service, uh, service providers, we can only know the number of cases that were reported, which are far fewer than the actual cases. If we communicate reported cases and donors interpret them as prevalence, we can also contribute to lower the funding for protection programs. We can and should use such admin data as, for example, the number of cases reported from our case management activities. But we should use them to make decisions on increasing staffing, for example, or increasing other resources. We shall never present them as prevalence. The good news is that use, the usefulness of prevalence data is deeply overestimated. We do not need in reality to know how many cases of violence there are in a community to decide to open a service to help survivors. There is an agreement in the humanitarian community that was even written down in the 2015 Interagency Standing Committee Guidelines on Gender-Based Violence, which states the following. All humanitarian personnel ought to assume GBV is occurring and in threatening affected population treated as a serious and life-threatening problem and take action regardless of the presence or absence of concrete evidence. So let's learn to program and work without such prevalence data and collect the data we really need. For example, let's collect information on dynamics and common patterns of protection incidents, which groups are most at risk for each type of violence and which elements increase or decrease the risk of violence for each group. In summary, start with identifying use and information needs and use existing data first for your analysis. Only collect new data if gaps are not filled through secondary data. Data does not only mean numbers. Numbers and percentages are useful, but also other types of data are necessary. Each method and source can provide some data, but none is sufficient. Methods and sources are complementary one to the other, and you should use all data from all relevant methods and sources. Use and mix qualitative and quantitative methods to obtain a solid basis for your analysis. Never forget that your field staff has a wealth of knowledge on the situation that you can tap into if you know how to ask and what to ask them. Do not try to get prevalence of violent incidents through any methods and source. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope this helps you in your analysis and response. And if you want to know more, there are some resources online that you can use.